ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the annual Airbus press conference where we'll present and discuss our full year 2023 results. My name is Julie Kitcher. I'm Chief Sustainability Officer and Head of Communications. And here with me today to present the results are Guillaume Forey, our Chief Executive Officer, and Thomas Topfer, our Chief Financial Officer. And welcome, Thomas, to your first Airbus Results Conference. So we're so happy to have so many of you here with us again in Toulouse at our event center. So a big thank you for being here with us and making the trip. Uh, and of course, a big thank you too to those of you who are following us live online. So today, Guillaume and Thomas will explain how Airbus managed a complex 2023 to deliver on achievements and what the road will look like ahead in 2024 and even beyond. So Guillaume will start by sharing the key highlights for Airbus in each of our businesses. Thomas will then provide you with a deeper dive into the 2023 financials. And then Guillaume will highlight some of the achievements on our sustainability roadmap before we move on to our Q&A session. Those of you following us online will be able to submit your questions remotely using the live e-tool. And of course, the entire press conference will be conducted in English with no simultaneous translations. So, ladies and gentlemen, those of you who've been following us for some time, as usual, please familiarize yourself with that safe harbor statement. And for those of you who discover it for the first time, please read it closely. You can see it now on the screens. Please remember that forward-looking statements such as our guidance are based on assumptions. And as conditions may change, well, so may our projections and plans. Now, before I hand over to Guillaume for an overview of 2023, I'm really pleased to share this video with you, which is a great reminder of the key achievements of Team Airbus during 2023. A big thanks to the team who uh, put it together. I hope you enjoy it. We certainly had a lot of fun putting it together and looking back on the year. So we'll be back with you in a moment. In 2023, aerospace thrived driven by strong demand for air travel. At Airbus, we shared a clear focus, performing for our customers today and building the aerospace of tomorrow. We strive to deliver the aircraft our customers needed when they needed them. And we welcomed new customers to the fold. We continued to transform our company, pioneering, innovating, developing technologies to deliver a sustainable future for aerospace. Our defense and space solutions contribute to global security needs for the benefit of society and bring humanitarian aid to where it is needed most. We reached far beyond Earth, and our own satellites monitored the world in incredible detail. This was Airbus in 2023, pioneering sustainable aerospace for a safe and united world. Thank you, Julie. That's a great purpose for a company. And um, from my side as well, good morning and, and thank you for uh, being with us in Toulouse or following us online this morning. It's good to see uh, so many people in the room. Um, I'm sure that uh, most of you by now are already familiar with the figures and highlights of our full year results, which we shared with you a few hours ago. So I will try to keep my opening remarks relatively short to leave time for your questions, and I'm sure that you have plenty as usual. Um, across our businesses, we saw a very strong order intake in 23, 
notably reaching uh, new heights for our commercial aircraft business, as well as for our defense and space division. For commercial aircraft, it was a landmark year as we reached a record-breaking level of uh, aircraft orders and backlog, which gives us long-term visibility and clearly supports the production targets for our single-aisle and wide-body programs. Overall, we achieved our 2023 guidance and delivered a solid set of underlying financial results, reflecting the commercial aircraft deliveries, a good performance by helicopters, and in military aircraft systems, however, some 600 million euros of charges recorded in certain of our space programs. Based on these results, our growth prospects and the strength of our balance sheet, with a net cash now exceeding 10 billion euros, we're happy to propose a dividend payment of 1.8 euro per share, along with a special dividend of 1 euro a share to the AGM later this year. We'll, of course, give you more details on the financials later. Let's look first um, at the performance in commercial aircraft. In Q4, we delivered 247 commercial aircraft, which took our full year 2023 deliveries to 735 units, a year-on-year -year increase of plus 11%. We progressed on our production ramp-up against the backdrop of an operating environment that remained complex and affected by supply chain challenges and geopolitical conflicts. So at the end, that's quite an achievement in my view. We booked a record level of 2,319 gross orders, including 1,039 in Q4 an all-time record for Airbus, confirming our customers' trust and positioning in the market. Our order backlog in units stood at 8,598 aircraft at the end of the year. So close to 8,600. On the A320 uh, family program, production is progressing well towards rate 75, 75 aircraft per month in 2026. During 2023, we started the construction of an additional A320 final assembly line in Tianjin and Mobile. And towards the end of the year, we delivered the first A321neo from the final assembly line here in Toulouse, which followed the first A321neo delivered from Tianjin. On Exceler, our first customer aircraft entered into the final assembly line in December. And following finalization, of the certification documentation, which will take a bit more time than initially expected or expected till recently, the first delivery of the XLR is now planned to take place in the third quarter this year. Finally, on the wide body, we continue our ramp up towards a monthly production rate of four aircraft in 2024, so this year for the A330, and rate 10 in 2026 for the A350 while making progress on the development of the A350 freighter, uh, the freighter derivative of the uh, A350 aircraft. So now on to um, helicopters. In 2023, we booked 393 net orders compared to 362 in 2022 across all programs with a book to build above one, both in units and value. It includes a remarkable performance on the medium segment and on services in the last quarter. In the fourth quarter, we signed an agreement with Germany for the purchase of up to 82 multi-role H145M, the largest order ever placed for this platform. The contract also includes seven years of support and services. We also signed an agreement with the French Armament General Directorate, the DGA, for 42 H145 helicopters, 36 for the Sécurité Civile, and six for the Gendarmerie Nationale, plus 22 options on top. This contract also includes a range of support and services solutions. Overall, in helicopters, 2023 was a stronger, 
and we continue to see positive momentum for both civil and military markets. And finally, <coughs> on to um, our defense and space business. In 2023, uh, we were pleased to record a strong order inflow throughout the year. 2023 order intake totaled 15.7 billion euros, up 15% year on year, and corresponding to a book to bill significantly above one. This commercial performance confirms our long-term ambition for the division and highlights the strengths of our products in this business. Key orders recorded in Q4 including Spain's, Spain's order for 16 C295s, which will enhance the country's national security and search and rescue capabilities, as well as the launch of development activities to equip 15 German Eurofighters with electronic warfare capabilities. In the area of unmanned aerial systems, we signed a contract with Spain for the development and acquisition of the CIRTAP drone. It's a new tactical unmanned aerial system, which we expect will also play a key role on the international market in the years to come. On FCAS, we continue progressing on the phase 1B with all our partners in the different pillars of the FCAS program. We also continue to make progress on Eurodrone, even though we have recently acknowledged some delays in design specifications, we are now working to complete the so-called PDR, the Preliminary Design Review, later this year in order to enter into service by the end of this decade. I'd like to uh, also highlight that next year will be a very important one for the space and for launchers. On Ariane 6, all hot fire tests necessary for the maiden flights were successfully completed. The first launch is targeted for the middle of the year, subject to the clearance of some final tests. We are, of course, involved in Ariane 6, as you know, via the joint venture Ariane Group. Before we move to financials, I'd like to give you a short update on the transformation we initiated in defense and space in early 2023, aiming at making our organization simpler, more agile, and more customer-oriented. In January, on January 1st, this year, a new organizational structure went live with three business lines, air power, space systems, and connected intelligence. In this new setup, air power covering the former military air system and FCAS, in this new setup, around 15,000 employees are transferred from the current functional matrix organization, and mainly engineering and operations, to the three uh, business lines, giving them the means for a clear end-to-end -end business ownership and accountability. Hence, I consider they are fully equipped and empowered. This transformation will also allow us to address the long-term cost structure more efficiently, as I have experienced with previous transformation programs. And given the long-term nature of the business we're in, it will take time to grasp the, the full benefits of changes such as this one, but we'll get there. And now, um, over to you, Thomas, for a look at the financials. Well, thank you very much, Guillaume. And good morning to everybody here in the room, and of course, for everybody following online. I can say it's a great pleasure to be here for my first Airbus annual press conference. So let me talk you through uh, the key elements of our 2023 financials. And I would like to start with the top line, and you have this on the left-hand side of the page. So as you can see, we generated revenues of 65.4 billion euros. That is up 11% compared to 2022. And it mainly reflects the higher number of commercial aircraft deliveries that we had in 2023. If you look at our full year EBIT adjusted, and you have that in the middle of the page, you see the number increased by 4% year over year to 5.8 billion. But let me first of all uh, remind you where we come from, because 2022 actually included a net 0.4 billion positive impact from non-recurring elements. And the year-on-year -year improvement mainly reflected the higher commercial aircraft deliveries, a more favorable hedge rate, and the solid performance at helicopters, which was then partly offset 
by investments for preparing the future and also the charges that we had to take for certain space programs. Now, when it comes to these charges and building on the work done for the first nine months of the year 2023, we extended the scope in the fourth quarter and we reviewed in depth our space programs. And this resulted in 0.2 billion of additional charges from the updated estimates at completion for those programs. So now for the full year 2023, the charges of 0.6 billion have been recorded and they account for revised timelines, they account for better cost estimates, as well as for the reassessment of the commercial risk and also the opportunities that we have. And I would say while this high-tech business, of course, always carries some risk, we have now a balanced assessment of the business in our accounts. Now, if you look at the results by business, the commercial aircraft EBIT adjusted increased to 4.8 billion from 4.6 billion in 2022, and that is reflecting the increase in deliveries and a more favorable hedge rate, partially offset by the investments for preparing the future. If you look at Airbus helicopters, our EBIT adjusted was 735 million euros. That's an increase of around 15% year over year with a profit margin of 10%, and that confirms the very solid performance of the division over the last few years. And last but not least, if you look at Airbus Defence and Space, the EBIT adjusted here was 229 million, down around 40% compared with 2022. And this decrease, of course, reflects the charges resulting from the update of the estimates at completion in certain space programs that I was already mentioning, partially mitigated by the good performance of the rest of the business for the period. Now, turning to the consolidated EBIT reported, this was around 4.6 billion for the year, with adjustments totaling a net negative of 1.2 billion euros. And included in that 1.2 billion negative was an impact of around 1 billion from the dollar working capital mismatch and the balance sheet revaluation. And this effect mainly reflects the purely mechanical impact arising from the difference between the transaction date on the one side and the delivery date on the other side. And so overall, we reported a net income of 3.8 billion euros for the year, with reported earnings per share of 4 euro 80 per share. If you look at cash and you have the free cash flow on the right hand side of the page, our free cash flow before M&A and customer financing was 4.4 billion, reflecting the strong commercial aircraft deliveries and the pre-delivery payment collection from commercial aircraft, especially also in the months of December, so that our net cash position stood at 10.7 billion at the end of December and our, our liquidity remains well above 30 billion. And with that, I would now like to hand it back to Guillaume for some achievements specifically in the field of sustainability. Thank you, Thomas. <clears throat> Indeed, moving on to our uh, decarbonization roadmap, 2023 was another year of progress on our journey from ambition to actions and results. You will remember that in 2023, we received the validation from SBTI for our near-term climate targets and we are reducing CO2 emissions in line with that trajectory. In parallel, we fulfilled our pledge of using 10% SAF in our own internal aircraft and helicopter flight operations last year, 10%, including delivery flights, and we are on the way to using at least 30% by 2030. Easy to remember. Secondly, Airbus is acting as a catalyst in the broader aerospace ecosystem. ICAO state members committed to a much needed global SAF policy framework in Dubai at the end of 2023, the CAF3. We continued our efforts to drive SAF deployment, illustrated by commercial demonstration flights, as well as partnerships with SAF producers. More than 40 airlines have committed to ensure SAF supplies at least 10% of their fuel needs by 2030. We are making progress. It's still slow, but the industry is moving in the right direction and accelerating. It gives me hope. In addition, on direct air carbon capture and storage technology, 
Lufthansa and Air Canada, following EasyJet in October, joined our Airbus carbon capture offer. It demonstrates the airline's willingness to advance their own decarbonization goals. On, um, on innovation and technology, we're working on a number of what we call techno bricks for new aircraft technologies, both for the next generation single aisle that will be fueled by up to 100% SAF and the hydrogen powered 0E, which is targeted for entry into service for 2035. We continue to explore techno bricks and solutions which support both fuel cell and direct hydrogen burn options for the 0E. And the fuel cell results are really promising. Last year, our zero E teams achieved indeed the power on of what we call the Iron Pod, a representative test model of the hydrogen propulsion, which might be used on a zero E concept, such as the one you see on screen. As well as the hydrogen fuel cell system, the Iron Pod contains the electric motors needed to spin a propeller and the units that control and keep them cool. So um, its successful power on at 1.2 megawatts that we achieved is an important step on our roadmap to put a hydrogen propulsion aircraft into service by 2035. And we will continue to mature this so-called techno brick and others throughout um, 2024. These initiatives and others underline our commitment to take action towards building the low carbon future and to bringing airlines and industry players from all sectors together in order to shape the future of aviation. Overall, we have now established a strong momentum on sustainability and will continue playing our catalyst and advocacy role to make 2024 a year of action. I would say another year of action. Now, um, let's move forward and have a look at our outlook and priorities uh, for this year and beyond. I will start with our guidance, always important, which is as follows. As the basis for its 2024 guidance, the company assumes no additional disruptions to the world economy, no additional disruptions to air traffic, to the supply chain, to the company's internal operations, and our ability to deliver products and services. The company's 2024 guidance is before M&A, and on that basis, the company targets to achieve in 2024 around 800 commercial aircraft deliveries, an EBIT adjusted between 6.5 billion euro and 7 billion euro, and a free cash flow before customer financing of around 4 billion euro. The guidance reflects our expected growth trajectory and the investments we are making to prepare the future. I would also refer you to our press release and analyst presentation for our new free cash flow definition starting January 2024 and the guidance, the 2024 guidance is issued on that basis. So um, apart from the numbers, what are our key priorities in 2024. First of all, we remain fully committed to serving our customers and their strong demand for our modern, fuel-efficient commercial aircraft. We're working closely with our global supply chain partners as we ramp up across all programs at the same time with safety and quality at the heart of all we do and uh, within the new organization setup that we've put together and that started on the 1st of January. <coughs> to support our increasing production rates, we continue to invest, modernize, and adapt our global industrial system. On our supply chain, we closely monitor the situation as we will continue asking for more. We're operating in a rapidly changing world where geopolitical shifts the acceleration in innovation and the importance of decarbonization are growing in focus, and we're working to rise to the challenges and opportunities ahead in those areas. It also comes 
with the need to transform our defense and space division, I elaborated on it earlier. At the same time, we keep pushing forward on our ambitions in digitalization and decarbonization. So that's a good program for 2024. And with this, back to you, Julie. Thank you, Guillaume. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are about to begin our Q&A session. So for those of you who are with us in the room today, please raise your hand until one of our communications colleagues comes to you with a microphone. And please don't forget to state your name and your publication clearly before you ask your questions. And then for the media colleagues who are following us online, you can use the live e-platform to submit your questions in writing. Please submit them in English. In case you're experiencing any technical difficulties, of course, as usual, please reach out to the email address which was provided to you earlier this week, uh, along with all the necessary uh, technical details. So let's begin the Q&A session now. We'll try to take as many questions as we can and we'll prioritize questions, of course, from the physical audience here in Toulouse. So now, dear media colleagues, I see a number of hands. Um, we'll start at the front here. Thank you very much. Good morning, Sebastian Steinke from Flugrevue in Germany. I have a question concerning the A321 XLR, please. You, Mr. Fauri, you mentioned that there's a slight slip to Q3 in this year. Could you kindly elaborate a bit on what you are doing uh, with the aircraft and if the range predictions might uh, change somehow? Thank you. So we are actually... Uh in the final phase of completing the certification and the industrialization of the, of the plane that fully uh, matches the expectation uh, that we have for the, for the product. So that's a very strong new product in the family of the uh, A320 uh, aircraft. Um, we're in the finalization of the documents. As you know, coming close to certification, we need to close all of them, and there are thousands. And um, in the um, preparation of the planes uh, for the first deliveries, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the first plane has been entering into the fall end of last year. And uh, we were so far planning entry into service in Q2 2024, now for many, many quarters in a row. Uh, we have a slight delay when coming to finalization of those activities. So it's shifting um, from, from uh, Q2 to Q3 this year, but we are very close to the entry into service, and that's something we have also uh, discussed with our customers, and for most of the aircraft, it doesn't change the, um, the delivery dates that is planned, so that's coming close to the, uh, to the moment where we really end over the first product to our customers, and that's, uh, I'm satisfied with the progress of the program. The range is what it was supposed to be. I mean, we have um, finalized the, the flight test phase, so we have now a lot of data and uh, we have a range up to uh, expectations of what we had when we launched the program. So the, the general performance overall is very strong. So very satisfied with the, the performance point of the product uh, as what we were targeting when we launched the program. Sid. Good morning, Guillaume. Sid from Bloomberg. Just a quick question on supply chain. What are the current bottlenecks in the supply chain and what are you doing to sort of resolve them? And are suppliers still struggling financially? And will you be looking at sort of uh, continued support? I mean, I know that you talked about it last year. Will you have to continue to support suppliers financially going forward? And also on Spirit Aerosystems, if I may, uh, what is the current status of discussions with Spirit on the repricing of the 220 and the 350? which they said that they were currently in negotiations with Airbus on? Well, the, the supply chain is a, is a world of bottlenecks uh, at the moment, and we have as many situations as we have suppliers. Um, their situation is very much depending on the type of activities they're in, their uh, geographical uh, position, and, and how easy they can order parts themselves, they can hire and train people in a very constrained environment when it comes to uh, accessing to, to skills and to labor. So it, it's, it's a lot of complexity. There is not a single bottleneck that is um, to be resolved. It's plenty of them. And I explained a bit earlier that we're trying to find a, the right 
um, I call it the sweet spot between the very strong demand we have and the many, many bottlenecks and critical paths we have on the supply chain. So that's something we're looking at very carefully. Uh, no surprise that engines, which are other big systems that come to the plane, um, are one of the potential bottlenecks that we are monitoring very carefully. But there are a couple of others in, um, in equipments. Um, and some big tier ones are facing difficulties with their deliveries to us for 2024 and, and beyond. Spirit, I will comment as well, has, has been um, an area of, uh, of challenges. You mentioned rightly so the A350 and the 220 that are ramping up uh, very strongly. These are actually the two programs which are accelerating at the fastest pace even if the, the bulk of the ramp up due to the volume is the A320, we go from rate 4 to rate 10 on the A350 within a few years. And we go from rate 4 to rate 14 on the A220 within sort of five years. So um, that, that explains why the, those two programs are, um, are being discussed. Spirit is in the situation you know. Uh, they are one of the suppliers which are uh, in financial difficulties. And we are discussing a lot of um, parameters of the contractual relationship with them, price being one of them that's been mentioned by Spirit, I think, in their call. But we're also monitoring very closely the speed at which they're investing for the ramp up, uh, how they manage their own supply chain to secure the ramp up. And we are supporting indeed a lot of suppliers, mainly through uh, seconding people at the sites, um, helping to mature their own. Um, um, industrial maturity, their own industrial performances. We are looking at their own supply plan. We are making sure that they have uh, the means in place. And we are supporting them on action uh, at sites, much more than financially directly. The, the financial support is done through other mechanisms. And most of the suppliers, which are actually in difficult financial position today, are much lower in the supply chain. And in most of the cases, we don't have direct relationship with them. But we are monitoring very closely the fact that the situation is being dealt by their own customer, which might be our tier two, tier three uh, suppliers, or sometimes the tier one, to make sure that they don't create new bottlenecks or new ruptures in the supply chain. This takes a lot of effort and time. Uh, we have increased over the last two years the, the size of our own department in charge of uh, supply chain management by a factor of 2.5. So uh, plus 150 percent more people uh, to deal with the supply chain because that's indeed the bottleneck to the ramp up. And that's what we're monitoring very, very carefully, as I said already. Hello, uh, it's Timo Novak with Aerotelegraph. I've got two questions. The first about the XLR also. I would be interesting, interested to know how many orders have been placed for the XLR in total right now and how many deliveries are you planning till the end of this year? And the second question, as I understand it, you're running risks of delays with the deliveries end of this year and I would be interested to know which models could be concerned. Thank you. Okay, so we'll try to find the exact number for the uh, order book of the of the XLR. Um, it's, I mean, it's around half a thousand of planes, so the, the product is very successful um, at that stage within the order backlog of the of the A320 family. It's the high-end product, so for the high-end product of the family, having such a strong uh, backlog is, is very positive for us, and that's also a place where there's little competition, so we, we are happy with the positioning. Um, so we start the entry into service uh, in Q3 this year, so it will be a handful of products, uh, of planes delivered this year, and the ramp up will uh, accelerate in 2024. We always start slowly when we're in the ramp up of a new product for industrialization reasons. You want to be able to solve also issues on the production system, so not being too fast at the at the very beginning. And when it comes to the to the risks, uh, well, they are distributed on the uh, on the, the products on the different. We have four product lines. Um, the, the biggest, the, the, the lion's share of the ramp up is on the 320 family. So that's obviously where we might face more risk and more difficulties as we move forward because the volume is important. But as I said earlier, in terms of acceleration, uh, the 350 and the, the 220 
um, are, are um, dominating in terms of, of acceleration. And therefore, that's where we monitor very closely as well uh, the ability of the suppliers to, to serve that ramp up and how, to what extent they have anticipated the resources they need. So I would say it's distributed and we try to find program by program the right balance to be, to be balanced in terms of risk and opportunities. So overall, we can reach the um, uh, around 800. And that's also why we are not guiding by product because we can have up and downs, and within the portfolio of four product lines, uh, it's more likely to be uh, reasonably balanced, and that's what we saw in 2023. Okay. So for the XLR question, uh, we've got more than 4,900 A321 NEOs in the backlog, and Stefan's in the room. I'm sure he'll get us the, the exact A320 uh, uh, XLR number. <laughs> 550? Yep. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> 550 for everyone, XLR in the backlog. Good morning, Mathieu Rabéchaud from AFP. Um, Mr. Forey, could you walk us through the, um, the difficulties of the space activities mentioned in the statement? Uh, you, you, what are the causes of your change at estimates of uh, the certain mm -hmm. programs? Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's been a, a bumpy ride in 2023, coming to realize that uh, on some of our programs uh, at the mid of the year, uh, we had uh, two optimistic assumptions for programs, which are long-term programs, which are um, um, reported uh, through what we call estimate at completion. So you have to make a fair assessment of your future uh, ability to do the ramp up, your future cost, your entry into service dates, uh, the commercial cost, and as well the future commercial conditions. Uh, in an environment that has been quite uh, challenging and fast changing, we came to the conclusion um, at the end of the first half that we had to take some additional charges because the overall balance of risk and opportunities and, and the way forward uh, was not reflecting fairly what we believe today is uh, the most likely time to develop uh, the cost um, um, that we will face, the time it will take. And digging into the, uh, the situation, we went to the very bottom of uh, our space programs and uh, came to the conclusion that there were other programs in the same situation, that we had to go deeper into the assessment. And as I said earlier last year, uh, with, a, with a will to have in all our businesses a good balance of risk and opportunities. That's obviously more difficult in complex and sophisticated products where in, when we are in the development phase of those products to estimate the future. That's always a guess. Uh, but we, we came to the conclusion that we had to uh, re-baseline, sort of re-baseline or, or put charges to reflect better what we think is ahead of us. So that's really for forward-looking program. And when you have some loss-making programs, you have on top to record everything that comes in the future uh, in the day you recognize this uh, additional cost and, and time to get there. It's important for me to, to have in all businesses what I call this good balance between risk and opportunities to be able to say what we do and then do what we say and not come with uh, uh, surprises uh, when we are in the execution mode. And that's what we did in, in the space. Space is a challenged business at the moment, uh, independently from our own assessment of the future and therefore the, the cost and the time and uh, the commercial conditions. Uh, it's an uh, environment that remains under pressure and uh, that calls for a lot of action. This being said, uh, we had good bookings last year. I think we have very strong products and we are really innovating in space. Uh, so that's also the price to pay for this uh, high innovation, new technologies, and therefore taking risk. And uh, I, um, I really say to my staff that it's okay to take risk. We have to take risk to innovate, but we have also to understand very precisely, more precisely, what we think it will cost to um, go to the development, entry into service, and ramp up of the products. So what we have in our books reflects better uh, what we think will be the cost moving forward. And that's what we did this year. A lot of work with the teams, as you can imagine. I'm not satisfied with the process, but I'm satisfied with the outcome of having now what uh, Thomas called, I think, a balanced view on our space activities. Okay, so we're going to take one from online. Um, the question comes from Tim Heffer from Reuters. 
Uh, what triggered the reassessment of your space portfolio and do you think consolidation or disposals are likely to play any role in stabilising that business? And the second question, suppliers say the A320 production is quite a bit below the planned levels, which would have seen output closer to 58 a month by now. What are you seeing that makes you so confident in your target of 75 a month in 2026? Okay, so uh, hello team. I'm, I'm more used to see you in the room, so I'm, I'm missing you. Um, so I think I sort of, I hope, answered the first part of your question on, on space. Uh, what triggered the reassessment? I think I, I, I explained as good as I can what we, what we did in this time frame. Um, well, as I said as well, uh, it's, um, it's a sector that is under strong pressure. And indeed, uh, in that case, uh, looking at uh, uh, M&A, because that's what you're suggesting, is part of uh, what we have to do. This being said, it's already a sector that has been highly consolidated. And I see our internal um, activities, our internal turnaround or, or improvements uh, that we're doing across the board at Defense and Space, and more precisely, uh, at space, also with uh, change of management as what is on our plate for 2024. Just to be very, very clear, so it's uh, first do what we have to do in Airbus, for Airbus, um, on the space business. Um, on the A320, well, you know, we have uh, thousands of suppliers, I think more than 3,000 suppliers uh, serving the program. We have also some, some changes in the mix, uh, in some uh, customer uh, profiles, anticipating, readapting, readjusting. So there are up and downs for suppliers. Overall, I can confirm very clearly we're on track. On the A320 ramp up, we're on track. We delivered in 2023 according to our plans. What we anticipate for this year is also on track for the, uh, the ramp up curve that we have given to ourselves. And therefore, we confirm the uh, rate 75 in 2026. So I would say two words on track for the A320 ramp up. OK, thank you. So Uh, Gregor Wachinski with Handelsblatt uh, on the A320. Uh, are you seeing uh, an increased interest of uh, airline customers who historically or traditionally have centered uh, their fleet around the Boeing 737 MAX? I think the answer is yes, and it, it's not new. Uh, there's a lot of appetite for the A320. Uh, we are with a, a market share in bookings um, higher than 50% now for several years in a row, and that's a product that is considered very, very um, strong and very successful for our airline customers. Um, and all airlines of the world uh, are looking at uh, both uh, products which are, uh, which are competing for that segment, and um, I see a lot of interest across the board, everywhere in the world, for the A320 product. Good morning, Alex Macharis. Uh, good morning to you all. Um, Guillaume, the A220 is not performing as expected in certain markets, but specifically due to the ongoing Pratt & Whitney engine issues. Egypt Air returned its entire fleet of A220s, as you know. So my question is, what is the concern? How concerned are you that this risks putting off potential new customers? And is there a plan to overcome this challenge? Mm. Thank you. So indeed, we are not satisfied with the uh, time on wing of the uh, GTF on the 220. That's really a concern um, that um, is impacting the ability of the 220 to perform well, in particular in certain regions of the world. Now, we have so much demand for the 220, and we are in the phase of ramp up that we're focusing on the customers that are satisfied. Uh, with a product for which the, the GTF serves the needs, in particular uh, in regions which are out of hot and dusty or sandy environments. I would not take the Egypt Air single case as a, as a rule. And just to be, to be clear, there might be other reasons why the relationship uh, is in, in, in that place. Um, and that's not slowing down the orders. You saw we had a very strong order book for the order intake in 2023 for the 220. And it's not, 
slowing down the, the, the product serving needs. And it's a product, it's an aircraft that satisfies a lot the airlines that are using that the, uh, product, and especially the customers, the passengers, which are flying on the 220, really like the product. So that's an area where we need to continue to work uh, with uh, Pratt & Whitney. That's what we're doing. There's a plan for that engine uh, to be back to where it has to be. Unfortunately, uh, as always on engines, complex technology, it takes time. But again, in the meantime, we have enough on our plate with the market where the 220 really fits with the expectations to fully concentrate on that and ramp up the program. That will come later. Thank you. So we'll take, we'll take one here, Julie, please. Thank you. Iggy, I'm uh, Tom from Simple Flying. I wanted to touch a bit more on the Zero E. You said entry to service in 11 years from now. Uh, I wondered if you could talk a bit about the timeline that we should expect in those 11 years with the program um, and any particular challenges that you could face. And also, if you could just go a bit more into in depth on where you are right now with that, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks. <laughs> I, um, as you know, I love to answer those questions. Um, well, we're moving forward with Zero E very strongly. Um, as you heard, we keep investing on two technologies for the Zero E propulsion system, and they use hydrogen in both cases, but in different ways. It's a liquid hydrogen on board being either burned in a turbine, very close to what we're doing on conventional engines, or uh, being used in a fuel cell and therefore turning hydrogen into electricity, serving an electric propulsion system on board. And we keep working on those two streams for a few years. So that's the first uh, comment I'd like to make. Uh, maybe the other one is, of course, everybody's focusing on the product itself. That's, that's the part we see. Uh, and we're making very good progress. I'm very confident of the, the progress we've made over the past year and what we need to achieve in the next years to come to a program launch. But I always want to remind you that actually there are other things that need to come together for the launch of a program. The technologies, so the product itself, uh, the regulatory framework, that's less visible, but we can't be launching a product if we don't have certification standards for the production, logistics, distribution of hydrogen on, on site, on airports, uh, how to certify an airplane, so those kind of things that need to be taken care of. And third, making sure that the hydrogen ecosystem around the airports that will have to be served will be mature enough at the date of launch of the program so we know that the airlines that would order the product they would have the ability to, to find uh, green hydrogen, decarbonized hydrogen, where they want to fly their plane. And we have to take care of those three things. And that answers your question of the challenges that we have. One challenge is really in our hands, is the product. The two others, well, we need to be with other stakeholders, managing them. Of course, we want to play here again a bit the role of catalyst that we, the role that, that we like to use is the term we like to use is catalyst because we're helping, but we're not in full control. Uh, now, when it comes back to the product itself, uh, it's a launch of the program at the end of this decade to be ready for entry into service in 2035. And we are maturing what we call maturity gates. We're going through maturity gates as we move forward. And the next important uh, gate is the selection of the, of the propulsion system architecture, technology, the, the, the final positioning of the product. And that's something to be expected around 25, 26 for a launch of the program around the 27, 28. So that's basically the main, um, the main gates, the main milestones that I believe are to be kept in mind. OK, thank you. So we're going to take up a couple of questions online, and then we'll be straight back into the room. So the, the f next question is from uh, Delphine Tio from uh, Investia. Will you give an exceptional dividend or make a share buyback program every time your net cash position is more than 10 billion for the next years? What is the rule? Yes, maybe I'll take this one. Um, so to answer the question, let me give you a little bit of background, um, and then I think I will uh, come straight to the point. So we've been saying for a number of years that once we reach the 10 billion threshold in terms of net cash, we would look into potentially additional shareholder returns. And the first consideration for us, of course, was to stick to what we said and to stick to our words. Now, if you secondly talk to investors, I think there is no clear preference. Some do pre prefer a special dividend. Some prefer a share buyback program. Our consideration in this situation was to say, 
Um, we achieved the 10 billion threshold probably a little bit faster than what we had uh, anticipated ourselves with a very strong cash flow in 2023. And it was important to us to stick to our words and implement something that is, let's say, pragmatic and can be done relatively quickly. And on the other hand, um, that is in line with the overall magnitude of the amount. So I would say a share buyback program for that order of magnitude would not have been the right instrument. So that led us to the decision that a special dividend in the current situation, considering the good performance in 23, but also the outlook for 24, is the right instrument. Now, very clearly to the question, is that a mechanistic rule that will be applied every year? The answer is no. Um, it always depends on the situation and specifically on the outlook. And therefore, uh, we don't, don't want to make this a, a simple rule that, uh, that can be applied every year. OK, thank you, Thomas. So now we have Craig Coyle from Flight International with a question on the A400M. How soon do you need to win a big export deal to safeguard your current production and supply chain activity? There is pent-up demand for strategic lift. So why are buyers not committing to the A400M? Uh, thank you. It, it's a good question, I have to say. Um, Actually, we have de risked the program to um, make sure it's not too much exposed to one big export contract having to come at a very uh, precise moment uh, in the life of the program. So uh, we are making sure that the program can uh, benefit from export opportunities. Um, and therefore, there's no need to win a big export contract soon. But there is an appetite a strong appetite to win export contracts. And indeed, we have uh, discussions uh, with what I would call many um, potential export customers, uh, air forces of this world, that have the need for um, strategic uh, lift or um, for heavy lift with planes. And therefore, I'm, I'm optimistic that will come to fruition on some of those discussions. So that will come uh, moving forward. Why not now? Well, I think the, the program uh, is now gaining the level of maturity when it comes to the capabilities that fits with uh, going to export. And I believe we will see some of those export uh, discussions uh, turning into contracts uh, later, this year, next year. We are not too much in a hurry to see this happening. That's more the long-term success of the program that is relying on export. And again, I think that's going to come. OK, thank you. Hi, I'm Sylvia Pfeiffer from the Financial Times. I had two questions. Um, one is just on the supply chain. Um, just wondered whether you ever see the constraints easing fully, or is it something that the industry is now going to have to get used to on a permanent basis, given the persistent engine problems uh, and everything else? And then just I had a question on Atos. Um, you said you were in January that you were in talks or early stage talks to buy their cybersecurity business. Um, just given all the other problems going on at Atos, I just wondered how dedicated you are to pursuing this particular deal. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, the supply chain is actually improving. But as I said earlier, we're ramping up. So as they, they keep improving, we keep asking for more. That's the very nature of a ramp up. And that's why we have this permanent tension between what the supply chain is able to deliver and what we need. So we are pacing the ramp up, uh, looking at all those challenges, what we call the bottlenecks, the areas that are the most uh, difficult to, to, to improve. And that's a permanent balance uh, between demand and supply that we are trying to, to strike. So it's getting better. But it's getting tougher as we move forward. And overall, it remains a very uh, critical um, area of attention for us. And that's where we're putting a, a lot of effort, as I said. On, on um, Atos, actually, we are looking at what is called BDS. That is a 1.5 billion-ish turnover uh, out of 10 billion uh, turnover of Atos. So that's one of their activities that would fit very well in terms of content uh, with some of our ambitions when it comes to um, a more digital Airbus, so that would serve our strategy for the future. We are currently 
in due diligence with the company uh, to better understand whether it would really match um, our strategic objectives and uh, whether the, the content of the business uh, really fits with what we would need. And uh, would we come to the conclusion that is the case, uh, agreeing on a, on a price? Okay? So we are not there. We are at the beginning of this uh, process. And indeed, as you rightly said, the overall situation of uh, Atos, what they are going through, um, is making this uh, slightly more difficult. But we keep focusing on this as part of our uh, M&A uh, activities and, and review of potential portfolio evolution. That's not the only one, but that's one that is public and on which we are focusing our attention. Nothing has been concluded at that stage. As I said, we are at the beginning of the due diligence. Thank you. Uh, Eric Renet, uh, newspaper Le Soir in Belgium. <coughs> About the supply chain again, how can you be sure that uh, part of the, the, the problem doesn't come from uh, suppliers feeding the MRO of Russian Airbus fleet? In this world, how can you be sure for those kind of questions is always a challenge. So I won't pretend that we are 100% sure. What I can tell you is we have laws and regulations to comply with, and we are doing all what we reasonably can to look at uh, the flows, the, the, the volumes of orders, the information we can have access to, uh, the discussion with suppliers and customers in that case, uh, to comply with uh, what is expected in terms of embargo. At that stage, we think we have a reasonable level of understanding of what's happening. We are uh, discussing closely with the regulators and the states which are putting those rules and regulations in place, but we keep monitoring, and it's all obviously a, a risk assessment, a risk monitoring uh, that is um, more the word I would use than rather uh, how can you make 100% sure that, because a lot of things are depending on, on third parties which are not under our control, I would say. So we can just have indications, we can have statements, we can have declarations, we can do check monitorings that we're doing with our own uh, capabilities and, and crunching the data. But that's a, and that's a constant discussion. And obviously, as you can imagine, sometimes there are areas where we have some findings and we discuss those findings, but that's the world we're living in. Hello, this is Jorge Penalva from Avian Review. Hello, Guillaume. Um, I have got two questions. The first one, uh, despite Spain buying the C295, um, uh, we have declared that we will need more range. France is as well expecting, on the same way, a Malaysian patrol aircraft with more range. Will this mean that, combine these two countries, you may defreeze the A321 PMA? And the second question, is about the, as you call, the new generation aircraft, uh, the uh, new generation single aile aircraft. Will it be the stretch version of the A220, or will it be a different aircraft? Thank you, Jorge, for your questions. Uh, on the C295, I think this plane is victim of its success. Mm. <laughs> And I'm very happy to see that we have signed important contracts. There's more appetite for, for the plane and a better understanding of what it can deliver. And therefore, request for the plane to do slightly more, to do even better than what it's doing. So I would call it victim of its success. Uh, I'm not, I cannot be specific just because I, I'm not uh, skilled enough on this particular product to tell you where we are in the discussions on, on those improvements. But it's not. Uh, to be um, mixed with the A321 uh, maritime patrol. I think that's a, that's a different topic. This is what you had in mind, two different topics. Um, the, no, the, what we call the successor of the A320 or the, the future uh, single aisle, the one that we are preparing now, we're preparing the technologies for an entry into service uh, second half of the next decade, replacing this very important A320 family is not related to the stretch of an existing variant, of an existing uh, platform. It's a new platform. It will be a new platform. Uh, hello, Florine Galeron from uh, La Tribune. Uh, how many recruitments do you plan in 2024 worldwide and in France? 
and uh, maybe a word uh, on the big factory of green uh, kerosene that will be built uh, in the Pyrenees uh, in Le uh, It's important for us to be uh, a strong uh, partner in this kind of uh, project. Okay, so sorry, I didn't catch your second question. I was taking notes for the first one. I'll make sure Julie can help me in the meantime. Uh, 2023 recruitments uh, have been very strong. Uh, when you look at our numbers um, in our, in our uh, full year results, actually we've increased by more than 13,000 uh, the number of employees at Airbus. That comes with change of scope. So we have enlarged the scope, and that counts for around 1,700. And we have also decided to hire more from our subcontractors, from our, our um, temps uh, or, or third parties, to stabilize and secure the skills and competencies. So what we did was slightly different than what we anticipated beginning of this year. Still, uh, we have recruited very strongly. We think that, uh, and I will not be too specific on numbers because we are not completely stable on numbers, um, that we'll be hiring at a pace which is roughly half of what we did in 2023. But more, more details to come later when we have really understood where we want to land by end of this year. So we keep hiring as we speak today at a slower pace um, and overall it should be half of what we've done last year but that's a rough estimate, we'll be more precise later. So the, the second question was about um, Airbus partnering with renewable energy uh, producers in the Pyrenees. And, uh, and so I won't speak about that specific project, uh, but what I will say is that we're extremely active uh, with partners uh, locally um, in France and all our home countries as well as across the globe. And so uh, we're, we're working to be a catalyst. Um, and partner with, uh, yeah, with, with strategic partners for renewable energies, as well as the innovation and technologies required for de decarbonization. The challenge for us is on what projects do we want to be? Where are we putting the priorities? Knowing that there's now a lot happening, and that's very positive, but that we want to contribute our share to this acceleration. And you might have seen that I was uh, two weeks ago in Sweden where we signed an important partnership uh, for hydrogen development at airports in Norway, in Sweden. So that's a, that's a bit the complex uh, choice we have to make uh, to be on the projects with the highest potential of acceleration and fitting with our own criteria. Mm. Thank you. So we're going to take one from the online uh, questions. Uh, so from the Wall Street Journal, Ben Katz. Hello, Ben. Um, things seem to be on track regarding hitting rate 75 on the A through 20 in 2026. How seriously is Airbus considering further increases beyond that? Is there demand to go higher? And lastly, do you see your delivery target for this year as conservative? Thanks, Ben. Um, and that's only the second part of your question, actually. So there were a lot of questions. Uh, yes, things uh, are on track uh, for the rate 75. Um, how seriously is Airbus considering further increases? Well, we are not considering further increases, at least not seriously at that point. We are focusing all our efforts um, on reaching the rate 75 on time and today with an assumption that we would stay at rate 75 for some time and probably, in my view, for, for quite a while. So uh, that, that's uh, stability to be expected on the rate 75. And the second part of the question that has been removed was on how conservative. How conservative. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so again, Ben, um, when we give the guidance for the deliveries, it is, uh, as I said earlier for other topics, trying to find the right balance between the risk and the opportunities. So the around 800 is a, is a certain range, and we think that reflects fairly the risks which we see for 2024, sorry, for this year, and uh, the opportunities to, to do a bit more or a bit less. So that's, that's the good balance, that's a fair balance in our perspective. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Wolfgang Borgmann, Aero International Germany. Um, I have a question regarding the successor of the A320 series. 
Uh, Boeing is now starting to work together with NASA on the X-66A, and um, they are now testing live new technologies. Uh, when we are going to see something similar from Airbus, and uh, especially what do you see as a propulsion system? Is it uh, a soft-powered aircraft? Is this hydrogen combination burnt uh, uh, hydrogen uh, propulsion or um, something very different that we don't know of? So um, how do you see the, the road to this uh, A320 successor? Hmm. So um, actually, both on the uh, zero E, the hydrogen plane, and the successor, uh, the potential successor of the A320, we are in the test phase, and we are testing. And you might see some things in the in the media on the, the plane that will test wings with a bigger span, with uh, certain characteristics in terms of uh, adaptability in the air on the shape of the wing to alleviate the, the efforts in the wing. And as I mentioned earlier, we're testing the um, propulsion system um, of the um, hydrogen plane already. We did it last year. We will keep doing it this year. And there will be things in the air um, this year, next year, um, on those topics. Um, very clearly, uh, we have two projects ongoing which are different projects. One is bringing a hydrogen plane to the market by 2035, and this will be at the low end of the market, because hydrogen fits very well with this, because it's a place that will not compete with the rest of our product range, and we could then scale up, depending on success and time, uh, from that, uh, that position. And as I said earlier, we're refining the exact positioning of that plane in the, in the years to come before we launch the program. The successor of the uh, A320 uh, will be uh, a short to mid-range plane uh, who will be relying on burning 100% SAF. It's a SAF airplane. And we want to enable going from less than 1% of SAF usage today with SAF, which are expensive fuels, on the future generation of planes to enable going in, in practical terms in service from the very small percentage today to something that will be much closer to 100 by 2050. That's the plane that will be in service in 2050 when we want to reach carbon neutrality, and that's a big enabler of that carbon neutrality. So that plane is at the center, is front and center to our strategy to enable carbon neutrality for aviation by 2050. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, this is Hakan Çelik from CNN Turk and Posta Daily Newspapers. So there are wide disruptions and uh, barriers in, in uh, passenger traffic in, in some regions, and there are Unfortunately, there are conflicts and uh, some elections in, in major countries. What impact do you think geopolitical instabilities and global uncertainties will have in the medium and long term for aviation business? Thank you. I'd love to know the answer, <laughs> probably as all of us. And indeed, we've been through the past years already in, um, in big disruptions and geopolitical um, changes. Um, we are today in a world where free travel in the air is no longer the norm. The uh, Chicago Convention of uh, 1944 was making the air a place, a common good for humanity to enable free travel. With the embargoes and the situation of several conflicts, but in particular the one between Russia and Ukraine, this is no longer the case. It's a big impact on aviation. And we see other geopolitical um, developments that lead to the belief that uh, air travel will have to find its way, um, will have to, to adapt itself to these changes. This being said, there are also a lot of disruptions on the surface of the Earth. There has been a huge impact on uh, the traffic of ships through uh, the different uh, Suez and Panama canals for different reasons. Uh, and so what I'm suggesting here is the, the free travel of goods and people on the surface of the Earth is even more challenged than what we see for the moment uh, in the air. But that's indeed something we have to, to take into account. Now, discussing with uh, regulators and probably also leaders of the world, governmental and political leaders, they all value the fact that being able to travel 
um, is something that has a huge importance for humanity, for their countries. Um, mobility is seen as something that is very critical and sovereign for countries, and therefore they, they work together to continue to enable free travel of people and goods from A to B, and that's something that is helpful for, for the industry. But that's part of the bigger challenge of anticipating the geopolitical impact. Um, the, the events themselves are not easy to predict, and the consequences are even more difficult to predict. And what we're doing at Airbus with our partners is to try to build resilience and we are constantly discussing scenarios to make sure we would continue to operate and continue to be able to perform in this complex and, and uh, fast-changing environment. Thank you, Guillaume. So we have one now online uh, with respect to the Eurodrone. Uh, so from Pierre Tran, second line of defense. When will the PDR and CDR milestones be achieved on the Eurodrone? And will they be on time? Are there communication problems with Dassault Aviation? Hmm. So, um, I'm not deep into the Eurodrone, so I will remain prudent. But what I know is that the PDR, which is the preliminary design review, and that is a very important milestone of each and every program, when we freeze the general design, meaning uh, all specifications can be reached based on this uh, uh, general design uh, are reached, this has been postponed. And we took more time and we had some more challenges to come to this um, uh, uh, convergence uh, between specification and design. Um, and there are uh, four partners in the program. Airbus is the uh, integrator. And there are challenges um, in this program, like on all other programs. I mean, in, in this program, like others, in finding the combination of changes in the design uh, or, or selection of the design to come to a convergence. So there's no communication issue with any of the uh, different partners, but there are challenges in coming to convergence. So I would downplay a bit the things I saw here and there on, on communication issues. I think the communication is the one between partners, industrial partners, and we move forward on the Eurodrome. Thank you, Guillaume. Olivier? Mm, Olivier James from L'Usine Nouvelle. Um, are you seeing an increase in uh, quality problems in your assembly lines mm -hmm. due to the massive arrival of... Ah, so I see you now, sorry. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, are you seeing an increase in quality problems uh, in your assembly lines due to the mass massive arrival of uh, new recruits following COVID as Boeing and some suppliers uh, are also seeing? And if so, how are you doing to remedy this? Yeah, thanks, Olivier. It's a very important question. When we, when we started to ramp up in 2021, that's what we identified uh, as a risk. We had seen a lot of people uh, leaving Airbus, but uh, other companies and, and companies in our supply chain. And we identified the need for recruitment, for onboarding, for training, for reaching qualification and experience in the industry as a risk of going out of COVID. Actually, what we faced at the beginning was, was more critical, was the inability to recruit or to recruit at the speed. And that's one of the explanations for the difficulties we faced in 2022 to deliver on our ramp up plans. This being said, in the meantime, uh, the industry has organized itself. We discussed a lot during the Paris Air Show, what GFAS has done in France, but many other organizations have worked uh, abroad to enable accessing to talent pool and recruit. This being said, to secure uh, skills, qualifications, to avoid risks on quality and safety that are very important, we have decided at Airbus to recruit, to, to onboard a lot of people ahead, what I call ahead of the curve, to give enough time for onboarding, for learning. It's not just on the job, it's also the learning of all the regulatory framework, the way we do business at Airbus, then put people uh, with, uh, with coaches on their jobs to, to learn a lot of emphasis on, sec on safety. We have put a safety promotion center in place, for instance, here in Toulouse, and we're deploying uh, across our main sites to have a lot of people coming and learning not only the, the, the facts and figures, but the culture. Uh, so that's something we take very serious because it's indeed a risk, and we want to manage that risk uh, as good as we can. So I would say that's a risk that is identified on which we have our full attention 
Uh, we dedicate means, investment, efforts, good people to this, uh, trying to, to do well, but I want to stay humble again. Uh, ensuring quality in any industry is difficult, and in aviation it is difficult. So we want to take it for what it is and be very strong but humble and make sure that each and every person in the organization remains humble. That's the best way to be risk managers, anticipate problems, and make sure our products are of the, the quality that is expected, and therefore ensuring the safety that is an absolute must in our industry, an absolute must for our products. Thank you for the question. Good morning, Thierry Dubois, Aviation Week. Blue Condor is your research and technology program on the atmospheric impact on burning hydrogen. Uh, what are the early indications you are getting from flight testing? And second research and technology question would be on climate impulse, Bertrand Picard's uh, new project. Uh, Abbas is involved in climate impulse. What could you learn in hydrogen propulsion for your own zero-e project? Thanks. Mm. Yes, thank you, Thierry. Uh, so Blue Condor is one of the many programs that are helping us to understand um, how to use hydrogen, um, impact of hydrogen in flight, uh, what are the uh, emissions, what to expect in terms of uh, contrail and so on, on a technology that is a completely new technology. So we want to learn by ourselves. We want to put in place the program, uh, the programs that will enable us to um, understand before we launch the development what will be the implications of using hydrogen and on the way as well to manage, to identify and manage all the risks which are used to, uh, which are linked to the use of this new fuel. So one of the many programs. When it comes to uh, climate impulse, actually we are very happy that uh, Bertrand Picard and the team uh, came to us. Actually Bertrand uh, was in this room, uh, what, 15 or 18 months ago, giving a speech to our managers uh, because it's someone super inspired when it comes to innovation and overcoming uh, challenges and, and believing in the um, power of, uh, of technology, of progress. Um, and when he came with um, the, the Climate Impulse project to us, uh, asking for, for help, support, ideas, good people to, uh, to contribute to, that's what we have agreed to do. So we are indeed contributing to, but I want to just tell you that Climate Impulse is doing the design and the industrialization and the production. It's, it's their project, it's not an Airbus project, but we have indeed supported and we're happy to support. And why are we doing this? Because we're happy to see that others are entering into the field of hydrogen flight. There will be also a lot of learning for us uh, and having more and more players that show they believe um, in this, that are demonstrating capabilities of the technology um, to, to move forward, will contribute to break the syndrome, it will never work. In front of innovations, you have so many people being absolutely convinced with demonstrations why it will never work. A bit like what uh, uh, Lord Kelvin did in 1895 when he said, it's physically impossible to make objects heavier than air fly. And a few years later, uh, we had the first planes. So I hear a lot of people telling us why it's physically impossible to fly uh, planes with hydrogen. Bertrand Picard and, and Climate Impulse will contribute to demonstrate that it's not only possible, but it's serious to fly with hydrogen. Thank you. So we've got a growing number of questions in the room. So the more I answer questions, the more hands <laughs> in the air. <laughs> so we've got one uh, over here, then we'll go straight to the back. Good morning, Liz Alderman with the New York Times. Thank you for this press conference. Um, I just wanted to follow up a little bit on uh, a, a remark that you just made, Mr. Forey. And in, in general, I mean, as you've pointed out, and as we know, quality and safety are foremost in the minds of the flying public and of regulators in the wake of the Alaska Airlines incident. Um, you've obviously spoken about, you know, the issues of, of quality and safety, and a major concern that has been voiced um, w over at Boeing. Um, is that over, over time that company essentially pushed quantity over quality without, of course, asking you to comment on Boeing. Um, you know, as Airbus now moves to speed up production of your very popular A320 to 75 uh, a month, how do you reassure the public yourself um, of increasing quant quantity without compromising quality? And the second question is, how would you describe the safety culture of Airbus um, 
you know, it seems to be quite culturally strong uh, in, in Europe, despite the fact that Airbus is also a listed company that is beholden to shareholders. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I, I tried to answer to that question uh, a bit earlier today, but thanks for making it uh, so clear. Uh, actually, it's very clear. It cannot be uh, quantity over quality. That, that's very clear. And we don't want to deliver a number of planes. We want to deliver a number of planes which are of high quality and safe. And that's something we make very, very clear to our teams. Uh, and we have a lot of discussions in the management committee on those topics uh, when we are in the acceleration, in particular at the end of the year, where there are more planes coming to, to the delivery centers. Um, the only way, in my view, and I, again, I want to be very humble to, to, to do it, is to constantly believe you're not doing it is to constantly challenge yourself, review what you're doing, um, be afraid of what could happen wrong, and have this culture of uh, risk management being deployed across the organization. I don't think that has to do with shareholders or, or regions of the world or, or whatever. It's really an internal um, um, culture that has to be developed across the organization and that we're trying to spread as well uh, to our suppliers, but we're also learning from our suppliers. Sometimes they are better than us on a number of ways of doing business. We've looked at uh, other industries. As a person, I learned a lot in the car industry on a lot of practices that they do well. They have their challenges as well. But So I think that's the way we want to keep growing. But to be extremely clear, we cannot uh, do quantity at the detriment of quality, because what we deliver first is quality and safety. The product we deliver, what we deliver, is a safe transportation mode. And would we fail on this? I mean, we would have to be back to the drawing board because that's the very basics of what we do. And this industry, actually, when we look outside in, is improving safety, I mean, tremendously over time, and we want to keep doing this. Thank you. Right at the back. Hello, good morning. Guillaume Fauré, Hakim Kasmi from France Culture Radio. With, pro with the problems of uh, Boeing 737 MAX, uh, do you think to win a new, a new customers? Or, or is it possible that uh, you have a successful from the um, supply chain? <laughs> so, thanks for the question, and I'll try to, to answer as good as I can. Uh, we have our own challenges, and uh, one of the challenges that you know very well is the ramp-up in the complex environment that leads to a very strong backlog on the A320 family, um, serving our existing customers, the customers with whom we have contracts, and we really want to, to focus on them and make sure uh, that they trust what we do, that they trust that we're trying to serve them as good as we can. So what's happening in the broader industry, and you refer to, to the situation of the competitor, has obviously an impact on all of this, but again, we want to stay focused. We have a backlog to serve that's independent from uh, what could happen outside, and the, 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 the years where we start to have uh, open positions, that's now into the next decade. So that would more impact the long-term uh, competitive positioning of the two companies rather than the short term that, where we remain very focused on what we have to do. And I think for the few years to come, all OEMs in this industry, and I'm looking to the West, are also in that situation of trying to make sure that they address their situation, uh, their challenges, and serving their customers uh, with uh, large backlogs. So we have one in the middle. Um, hello, I'm Caroline Bruno from Aerospatium. Uh, I have two questions on the space industry. Um, will you replace the Pleiad Neo that's been lost in the Vega launch? And yet, can you please tell us what is happening with the delays on the OneSat program? And I have one last question about the suppliers. Some of them said they won't significantly <laughs> rise their prices for you. Uh, is there already discussion with them? And is it already included in your financial forecast? Thank you. So um, I will hand over to Thomas for the last question later to benefit from the support of Thomas. Um, Pleiad Neo, so for those who don't remember, so we have two satellites in the air and we were um, intending to have two more uh, that uh, crashed in the launch of uh, Vega C 
a bit more than a year ago. So actually, we are indeed missing that capacity. Uh, actually, there's a strong demand for the images of uh, Pleiad Neo. So the two first satellites have a very strong uh, activity, and we are very pleased with this. And therefore, we are considering, um, yes, uh, replacing partially, completely, uh, the uh, lost capacity of the last two Pleiad Neo satellites that were lost, uh, but we are not, we have not yet decided on which of the scenario uh, we we will conclude. But that's something we are uh, looking at. One sat. Um, is a program that is ongoing. We have recorded charges in 2023, uh, big time, uh, but we remain very committed to the program. It's a fantastic platform. I mean, in terms of technologies, in terms of uh, uh, customer offering, what it brings to, to the market is, is fantastic, and we'll keep moving forward with this program, for which we have already taken customer commitments for, as far as I remember, slightly less than 10 satellites and more to come. So we remain committed. And when it comes to supplier prices? Well, supplier prices, I would say, I mean, if you look at the overall charges that we took for the space programs, um, it's really a mixed bag of many, many things. Uh, you alluded to the topic of timeline. So this is certainly one of the things. Um, there is uh, the topic of internal cost, and yes, there's also the topic of suppliers keeping pace with our requirements in terms of deliveries. So the same issue that we're discussing for the commercial business also is true for our space business, that many of the suppliers are, uh, are struggling to keep pace. Um, the pricing topic, I would say, is only one aspect in a broad range of issues that we face, and, and therefore I would not overrate it. I would, I would concur with what uh, Guillaume just said, specifically on the OneSat program. It's a program where uh, we have already sold a high single-digit number of satellites. It's going to continue. Um, the delays that we're facing is only one aspect, so we're fully committed to it. And I would say also our supply base is committed to it. So again, the pricing topic is, I would say, a minor and not the one that, was the, the had, that had the biggest impact on the 0.6 billion. OK, thank you. So. Angel Calvo from the Spanish Press News Agency, EFE. Can you precise if one part of the charges for the, uh, for the space business is for the Ariane 6, and can you, can you develop a bit about the challenges for the Ariane 6 in front of uh, SpaceX? So um, our space business, what we call the space business, is satellites. So that was satellite. All of what has been said this morning on, on space business referred to the uh, space system business line uh, of Airbus Defense and Space. Uh, Ariane Group is a joint venture, as you know, between Airbus and uh, Safran. That was not what we were commenting on. Now, when it comes to um, Ariane 6, uh, the first challenge for Ariane 6 is to come successfully to market. That has to go through uh, the first launch that is planned for later this year. Um, still some, some tests ongoing. Uh, the, uh, the launch pad is also another um, critical path to the launch, and then the ramp up. Because actually, we have a significant backlog, or Ion Group has a significant backlog to serve, and they need to ramp up to serve on that backlog, to serve on the commitments they have taken, the contractual commitments. And there's more demand coming. I'm absolutely convinced that, based on what I see, and based on what I, I hear from customers, that the Ion 6 program will be a success once in service, because there is a demand for an alternative to SpaceX. It cannot be that the industry is relying on one launcher uh, and Ariane 6 at its place. And Ariane 6 is a very competitive launcher when it comes to the, to the capabilities and the precision of uh, putting a, a satellite in orbit, so it will find its place. Long term, it's more difficult to, to guess. The jury is out. It's a very strong competitor, as you know, with SpaceX that benefits from a lot of volumes and being served by a very strong US governmental market that we don't have for IN6. And we will have to find our way with IN6. Ariane will have to find its way on IN6 uh, to remain competitive over the years. But there is demand, and there will be um, a ramp up once we're in service. Thank you. So we're going to take one very last question, Court, at the, at the front. OK, I make a quick hi, Kurt Hoffman from Air Transport World. 
Uh, will aircraft prices increase, your lease prices, with all the supply chain issues and, and topics like this? And what is your expectations for the white body market in general, 2024, 330s, 350s? Mm. Thank you, Court. Um, so we have no longer price list, as you know. It's been a matter of discussion in the team. Uh, still, we... we keep trying to increase our prices, uh, but in line with what we believe is reasonable for long-term relationship with customers in this industry. It has to be predictable. They need that. Uh, it has to be justified. Um, and it has to make sense on the long run. Still, we see the cost going up. We see the demand going up. We need to invest. We need to innovate. So there are reasons for price being increased. But at the same time, there's competition that keeps putting pressure on prices. And that's what I commented on on the white body, where there is very, very strong uh, competition at the moment on the white bodies. The A350, uh, we expect, uh, again, strong uh, uh, order intake this year. Uh, we expect to see more deliveries in 24 than what we had in 23. And we also are improving the profitability of this program as we are back to rates that justify being profitable on the 350. You might remember that we reduced significantly the cost base of the 350 program over COVID, being back to break even with half the rates we had before COVID. Uh, and now as we will be uh, ramping up, we will see the program uh, delivering results and contributing to the investments we have to make for the future in the rest of the business. So very satisfied with the 350. It's an outstanding product. That's what we hear from our customers. OK, so thank you all, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the great questions uh, here in the room and online. And of course, thank you, Guillaume and Thomas, for the great answers. Um, we need to bring it to a close now. Once again, uh, it's been a pleasure uh, to have you with us and, and to have you online. And a warm thank you to all of my team in communications for, for putting it together. Uh, it's, yeah, it's always a, a big event for us. So thank you for that. And so any follow-up questions or any feedback that you want to share? Obviously, the team's around now for quite some time. Um, so please reach out to our media relations team. And uh, wherever you are, enjoy the rest of the day. And we look forward to exchanging with you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.